Well, that's really up to us. The masters of the universe, as they call themselves, are busily at work right now, as they always are, to try to ensure that the outcome of the crisis will be in their benefit, uh, even uh, more harshly in their benefit. And the question is whether other forces can mobilize to counter and overwhelm them. So, for example, right now, the, if you take a look at the uh, huge stimulus program that the Trump administration came out with, the biggest in human history, in US history, maybe human history, uh, it um, has some good aspects, but overwhelmingly, it's being directed to the needs of the corporate sector, the finance, and so on. They're, you know, eating at the trough the way pigs do. Uh, and if it continues that way, it, it's, it offers essentially nothing to the people who are the worst, the, the worst victims. And, and we can go through this in detail. But uh, yes, that's what's happening. Meanwhile, the fossil fuel industries who are intent on making as much profit as they can before they destroy the world, not in the distant future. Now they're appealing for more funding, more deregulation, and of course being offered it by the criminal Trump administration. So that's the kind of thing that's happening before our eyes. Uh, we can either counter it or allow it to come. Could be a much better world. Um, this is a good opportunity for people to think of what kind of world we want. Do we want to go back to the tragic history of recent years or do we want to overcome it? And there are many ways to do it, different in different countries. Problems in the US are very different from the problems in Egypt. But in each place, there are ways to try to overcome the tragedies and criminality of the past. But the it's not enough to know that it's possible. It's necessary to pick up the ball and run with it. Well, the US actually followed its usual policy when uh, some favored dictator is in trouble, case after case, uh, Somoza, Marcus, uh, Duvalier, and many others. Uh, the pattern is to support him as long as it's possible. When it becomes impossible, maybe the military turns against him, the business classes turn against him. And then what you do is uh, claim that you were always opposed to him, uh, send him off somewhere, you know, island in the Red Sea in this case, and try to reconstitute the same system as best you can. So that was what was tried. Uh, there were very serious problems internal to Egypt, which you can't attribute to the United States. And it ended up with a vicious dictatorship, maybe the worst in Egypt's history, which the US strongly supports and the business world strongly supports. They flock to Egypt for economic conferences to see what, uh, you know, what they can uh, gain from uh, robbing the people of Egypt at a desperate point. But uh, that's what you expect. The question is whether there will be means to counter it. And uh, mm. there can be in the United States and in Egypt. I mean, it's very hard to find a coherent strategy in the chaos of the Trump White House, uh, but you can detect something. The thing that comes out clearest is the effort to construct an international of the most reactionary states uh, and use it to be the base for the next phase of US imperial interests. So it's uh, in the Middle East, it means uh, uh, Sisi's Egypt, uh, uh, the Gulf family dictatorships, uh, uh, Israel is right at the center of it, 
they're all now cooperating almost openly, uh, moving a little beyond to uh, Modi's India, vicious Hindu dictatorship, uh, racist dictatorship, uh, which is trying to destroy the Muslim, huge Muslim community and dis dis uh, dismantle Indian secular democracy. Uh, moving on to Europe, uh, countries like uh, Hungary's Orban, which is verging on fascism, uh, Salvini in Italy, who's reconstructing something like Italian fascism. Uh, in Latin America, the prize example is uh, Brazil's Bolsonaro, who's uh, actually competing with Trump to see who can be the most uh, evil figure in the modern world. And if you can meld all of these together, you have a reactionary international, which uh, can serve as the base for extending, maintaining US power. Uh, there are particular enemies. The main enemy is Iran. The reason Iran is an enemy is well explained by US intelligence in their briefings to Congress. The problem is that they point out that Iran has very low military expenditures, even by the standards of the region, let alone the United States. Its uh, strategic policy is uh, de deterring, deterrent. I want to try to deter an invasion long enough for diplomacy to enter. They say if they are thinking of developing nuclear weapons, which they may or may not be, uh, that would be part of their deterrent strategy. Now, who is it who's opposed to a deterrent strategy? Well, rogue states, countries that want to be able to uh, use force freely without any impediment. And there are two of them, Israel and the United States. So naturally, they can't tolerate a deterrent. Incidentally, it's worth remembering in the US, you just can't talk about this maybe in Egypt you can. There's a very simple solution to any potential threat that anyone thinks Iran might pose with its weapons programs. Very simple. Actually, this is the answer was presented forcefully by Egypt uh, 30 years ago. Establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the region with tight enforcement, which we know can be done. It's just been done, in fact, in the case of the joint agreement, the, you know, the uh, recent uh, agreement with Iran on nuclear weapons, which Trump tore up, it was working very well, intensively monitored, uh, US intelligence, uh, International Atomic Agency recognizes that Iran lived up to it. So that's not a problem. So establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Uh, Egypt has actually been in the forefront of pressing for this since the 90s. Comes up every five years at the nuclear review meetings. Every time it's vetoed by the United States, nobody else is opposed. Iran is strongly in favor. The Arab states are in favor, led by Egypt. Uh, the uh, non-aligned countries, 130 countries, strongly in favor. U.S. vetoes it. Why? The last one was Obama, incidentally, 2015. Uh, the answer is known to everybody. The US does not want Israel's nuclear weapons uh, system to be inspected. In fact, the US does not even admit that it exists. The US says it doesn't know whether it exists, which of course, total nonsense, obviously, you know. And there's a reason for that. If the US conceded that Israel has nuclear weapons, US laws would begin to be invoked and US aid to Israel would have to be canceled. Not, not allowed to give aid to countries that develop nuclear weapons outside the framework of the non-proliferation treaty. So, so in order to protect Israel from inspection, the US is willing to uh, face serious dangers of major war breaking out, maybe just by accident, in its conflict with Iran, tells you something very important. 
also helps explain why this can't be discussed in the United States. You take a look, uh, do a Google search, uh, try the New York Times search index, can't mention it. Uh, it's perfectly obvious, it's right in front of everyone's eyes. As I said, Egypt is in the forefront of pressing for this, has been for almost 40, 30 years, uh, but you can't talk about it. Well, uh, th that's the re and the reactionary international has to be aimed against Iran. Uh, in fact, the way it's you know, plenty wrong with Iran, we could spend a whole session on the rottenness of the government, but that's not the point. Uh, at this point, Iran is suffering very severely from the virus. And the United States is consciously, openly trying to increase rapidly and massively increase the crisis, kill as many Iranians as possible by tightening the sanctions regime. The sanctions regime is illegitimate to begin with. Now, the US is the only country in the world that can impose sanctions, has about you know, probably 30% of the world's population under sanctions. And US sanctions are third country sanctions. Other countries have to observe them, even if they don't like them. So Europe strongly opposes the sanctions on Iran, which are now being used, extended in fact, to increase the torture at a time of need. They oppose it, but they can't do anything about it. Because you oppose US sanctions, US power throws you out of the international financial system. Okay, so you have to follow the master. None of this is acceptable. Uh, Cuba has been under murderous US sanctions ever since it achieved independence, uh, not because of anything it does, only because of, as internal documents in the US concede, because of what's called its successful defiance of the United States. And you can't do that. The world is run like the mafia. And if you defy the godfather, you're going to be punished. Okay, that's the way much of the world runs. Israel is called the one democracy in the Middle East, but that's uh, deeply flawed. I don't have to go into the details. Uh, for half the population that the U that Israel rules, it's not just lack of democracy; it's virtually living in a prison. Uh, yeah even within Israel proper, there's extreme discrimination. But going to the Arab world, uh, there actually has been one free election in the Arab world. It was in January 2006 in Palestine. First free election in the Arab world, carefully monitored, recognized to be fair and free. What was the result? Uh, the result was that the United States instantly began to organize a military coup to overthrow the elected government. Uh, Israel uh, increased its terrorist activities against uh, Gaza, uh, imposed harsh sanctions. The European Union, to its shame, went along. The problem was that the wrong people won. And an election is only fair and uh, acceptable if your candidates win from the point of view of the powerful. Wrong candidates win, you destroy it. So that's the one free election. Uh, Lebanon has semi-free elections. The confessional system that was left by French imperialism uh, strongly impedes the growth of genuine democracy. Uh, elsewhere you find bits and pieces, uh, limited forms in Kuwait, nothing much. It's mostly dictatorships. Uh, the Arab Spring was going to break with that. No, I don't think the Arab Spring is dead. I think it was beaten back, but the forces are still there. I suspect they'll rise again. It's a long process. Uh, the person who's maybe described this best, as far as I know, is Gil Ashkar, uh, Lebanese origin, teaches at the 
School of Oriental and African Studies in London, who's right away at the time of the Arab Spring said this is a very important step, but only the first step to a long process of breaking down autocratic institutions, uh, uh, culture of subservience. Uh, many steps have to be taken, but they can be taken. It won't win in a minute, but it can over time. And the recent uh, uprisings in Egypt are another indication of it. Uh, labor activism is another indication. The Tunisia has somewhat escaped the repression, but I think there are enough. You can even see it in the uh, family dictatorships, like in Saudi Arabia. The younger people are pressing for an end to the worst uh, imposed discipline of the, you know, Wahhabi uh, clerical leadership, and they're making some inroads. So it's a process which could go on. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of time unless serious steps are taken to reverse the growing environmental crisis. Most of the region is going to be unlivable, literally. Uh, you, can't, you won't be able to survive, so it won't matter. Same with South Asia. There are really desperate problems that have to be dealt with, and there isn't much time left. Uh, Aramco can't continue poisoning the environment. If it does, there'll be, there won't be any Aramco. You won't be able to live there. Uh, these uh, policies, these uh, threats are much deeper than the coronavirus threat, which is bad enough. And I should say, we I don't think we've come anywhere near seeing the severity of that. It hasn't yet hit the poor countries of the world, where it's going to be a disaster. I mean, in the deeply impoverished slums of Egypt, say, you're not going to be able to wash your hands every year. Uh, 15 minutes or sequester yourself uh, isolated from others and that's duplicated all over the world uh, that's going to be a utter catastrophe and what's happening and what's happening shows a degree of sadism that's difficult to describe so there's for example a shortage everywhere of ventilators uh, all the countries are trying to get the some share of them. They can't. The poor, poorer countries, even relatively rich countries like Brazil, can't get them because they're being outspent by the rich countries who want to take them all for themselves. If uh, hundreds of millions of people die elsewhere, it's none of our problem. I mean, this sadistic anti-human behavior in a competitive environment is just shows you that, you know, we're living in a really sick world. Uh, it's even narrower. I mean, take, say, the European Union. It's called a union. They're showing how much of a union it is. The rich countries like Germany have the virus pretty much under control. Right next to them, a couple of miles away, the epidemic is raging. Does Germany help? No, not our business. Not only does Germany not help, it's blocking the effort to create euro bonds, which could be a basis for helping the poorer countries. No, we just are in it for ourselves. If a couple of miles across the border and people are dying, not our problem. Uh, fortunately, the ones who are suffering in northern Italy can turn across the Atlantic for help from Cuba. Cuba is showing the one example of genuine internationalism, sending doctors aided by medical supplies from China to the most areas that are suffering the worst. That's been going on for many years. Cuba was largely responsible for the liberation of Africa. And African, Black Africans know it. 
when Mandela was released from prison, the first thing he did was praise Castro for his contributions to the liberation of Africa, beating back South African forces in Angola, laying the basis for the freedom of Namibia, and undermining apartheid in South Africa. Internationalism and selfless internationalism costs them a lot. They don't get anything from it. When there's a terrible earthquake in Pakistan, and the villages are destroyed and people are dying, Cuban doctors go. Uh, when the coronavirus is devastating Italy, Cuban doctors go. So genuine internationalism is not impossible, but it's necessary to rise to the level of civilization and culture of the countries that do it. And meanwhile, right next door to Cuba, uh, Trump canceled all aid to Palestinians, all through UNRWA, Palestinian hospitals, and he explained his reasons. They're not respectful enough of me. Okay. If you shine my shoes, maybe I'll give you some pennies. But if you're not respectful enough, I'll strangle you. That's right next door to Cuba. Now, there's a little difference in the power of Cuba and the United States. I don't have to go into that. And as I mentioned before, Cuba's been under harsh US sanctions ever since it gained independence. Well, the interesting thing about uh, the Kushner Netanyahu deal of the century, Netanyahu is basically the author. He handed it to this little boy who's Trump's servant to make it look like it's coming from the United States. Uh, the interesting question about this is why anybody is paying the slightest attention to it. I'm supposed that this proposal had come from China or Germany or any other country in the world. You wouldn't even bother to laugh at it. I mean, it's ludicrous. Why even look at it? Well, that's a sign of US power. When it comes from US power, no matter how ridiculous and grotesque it is, that becomes the central issue. So you read the sober discussions in the newspaper, it's, will it work? Is it fair? Is it going to have this defect or other? The, quite, the react, proper reaction was to laugh, to laugh and throw it aside. It's not even worth laughing about. Um, if you want to know what kind of deal it is, you just look at uh, the right wing of uh, the Israeli Foreign Office and what they come out with. That's the deal of the century. We don't have to go through the details. See? And it's, to its credit, it actually sort of formalizes what has been US policy anyway. Uh, so if you look back at US policy over the last 50 years or so, it's been basic. I mean, Israel's had a very definite policy, clear policy to create a kind of greater Israel, which will incorporate every part of the occupied territories that's of value to Israel, uh, connected to Israel with vast infrastructure projects, uh, leave aside the areas of heavy Palestinian population concentration. So Israel doesn't want novelists. Uh, you have to maintain what's called a democratic Jewish state meaning not too many Arabs. So the Palestinian population is left out, but everything else is taken. And the remaining Palestinian population is divided into literally hundreds of enclaves, small enclaves, virtually unlivable people, farmers separated from their fields, uh, checkpoints all over, uh, impossible existence. Hope is maybe somehow they'll leave. You know. That's the, has been the policy of every Israeli administration, including the so-called doves like Shimon Peres, who, who was the one who advanced settlement into the, deeply into the West Bank, what Israel calls Judea and Samaria. Well, the US has sort of sat by and funded this. Every once in a while they say, we don't like it, please don't do it, but then fund it. Okay, now it's out in the open. That's our policy. So to Trump's credit, yeah, he brought out the policy in its sheer ugliness, 
and sadism, which fits his character and view of the world. So now it's there for everyone to see. But aside from that, the deal of the century doesn't even merit a moment's comment and attention. China is a growing society, but it's a poor country. It's not like the United States. You take a look, say, at the UN Human Development Index, about the best measure we have of the health of the society. China ranks around 90th, uh, India around 130th. I mean, all this talk about China and India taking over the world is sheer paranoia. Uh, take a look at which countries can impose sanctions. One, the United States. Which country has almost a thousand military bases all over the world? The United States. Which country practically outspends the rest of the world, comes close to it in, in just military spending? The United States. Uh, which country has extraordinary advantages that no other country begins to share? Huge territory, enormous resources, homogeneous population. Uh, once they exterminated the native population, it was free for Europeans to take over. Uh, the, the economy of the first century was based on slavery, which created the worst system of slavery in history, created the basis for the modern economy. Remember that cotton was the oil of the world until the late 19th century. Britain prospered from this, the United States, others. Uh, finally, right now, there's no other country that begins to have the advantages of the United States. I mean, it happens to have a, to be a highly business-run society to an extraordinary extent. So that has its impact on the nature of the society. So we, you look at uh, OECD, you know, the rich countries, uh, uh, measures of social justice. Uh, the United States ranks practically at the bottom, next to Mexico and Greece. You, know. uh, you look at the health system, one of the problems now. The U US health system is a disaster. It's twice the per capita cost of comparable countries, some of the, the worst outcomes. Right now it's suffering severely because under the neoliberal regime, it's been following a business model. Business model means no spare capacity. You don't wanna waste money on having an extra bed in case something goes wrong. So the business model of what's called efficiency, no spare capacity, uh, just enough to get by in normal circumstances, and that's not so great as plenty of people, including me, can tell from personal experience, but at least it kind of works. If anything out of the range of normal happens, you're out of luck. Uh, in fact, if you look more closely at what's been happening, it's almost mind boggling. So take ventilators, which are right now the bottleneck of the system. I mean, doctors and nurses have to make agonizing decisions as to who to kill today because there aren't enough ventilators to go around. Why? Well, there's a long history, but let's just take Trump. In January, it was well known worldwide that there's a major serious epidemic, maybe pandemic coming. So what did the Trump administration do? It was shipping ventilators and other masks and other equipment out of the United States to China and other countries. That went on until March, when finally Trump recognized, look, this is no joke. So they started importing the same ventilators and masks from China and for the manufacturers and the, uh, the middlemen, the shipping industries. It's wonderful. They made money, money sending them out, making money bringing them in. And this is the kind of thing that goes on. It's uh, in fact, all through, in fact, if you want to really see a clear case, clear illustration of the mentality in Washington, take a look at the budget that came out for the next year budget proposal in mid-February when the epidemic was raging, no questions about it. Mid-February, 
Trump comes out with his budget, it calls for continued defunding of every of the Center for Disease Control and every health related component of the government. So keep defunding them as Trump has been doing all through his term, right in the midst of the pandemic. But other things have to get funded, like huge subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. That's the budget. And of course, the military. Uh, that tells you just what the mentality is of this criminal gang in the most powerful state in world history. Okay. Naturally, people are afraid of it. In fact, the United States around the world is feared and hated to an astonishing extent. You can see it just re reading the Arab press. You do it much more than I do, but just my little reading of the translations, it's unbelievable. In fact, I'll give you a personal anecdote that illustrates it. There's an internet scam going around, some lunatic article claiming uh, the United States uh, started the coronavirus in order to kill people in the world and take it over. It's attributed to me. Totally false, of course. I'm getting letters from all over the world, including friends, including colleagues, serious people saying, thank you for finally telling the truth. I mean, hatred of the United States is so extreme that people believe anything. Uh, but it's but the power you have to bow down before it's strong can't do anything about it until in the United States its own population manages to dissolve it and turn it into a more free society. The young people who worked hard for Sanders feel very depressed and think it was a failure, but they're mistaken. That's part of the Another odd fact of the United States, uh, there's no history, there's no historical continuity, there are no movements that continue and go back for a long time. Every movement started from zero, mostly young people, so they know nothing about what happened before. You take any serious social movement, uh, abolitionism, uh, women's rights, uh, Arab Spring, uh, anyone, uh, they go forward, they suffer setbacks, but they don't quit. They don't give up the first time you have a setback, you go on. You know, in fact, Sanders's uh, campaign was an enormous success, a lasting success. He changed completely the arena of discussion and even policy formation in the United States. Uh, crucial things that were regarded as ridiculous a couple of years ago are now in the center of attention. Uh, universal health care, free higher education, uh, workers' rights, uh, decent wages. It's all in the center of attention, mainly because of him. That's a tremendous success. He also did something else. He showed you can run a political campaign successfully without relying on private wealth and corporate power. That's a break with the century of US political history. These are great successes you can build from. You don't have to go home and cry. You know? And uh, I think, and I think much of the same is true of the Arab Spring. It achieved a great deal broaden people to understand, yes, there are things we can do. So let's do it despite the harshness of the dictatorship and much worse than anyone faces in the United States, of course. Well, Sanders made it clear he was in his withdrawal speech that the movement is not ending. The campaign is ending because of many circumstances, but the movement is going on. And it's up to mostly young people to put some flesh on those words to make them real. Can be done. It's done to be a much better world. But I'm afraid I have to go off. I have another interview coming. Okay. Okay. Yeah.